Well, my comment is more about uh, how I interpret this whole process. I feel that the people of Idaho weren't informed early enough. And uh, what concerns me more is I feel that to some degree the legal courses of action will you know, run their course and uh, the technicalities will be dealt with. And essentially, uh, ITD has done their job approve the law, and then so in that case, so has Exxon. But for me, the greater issue is that essentially the, the entire state of Idaho, the people of Idaho are, if they allow this to happen, we essentially become complicit to this, this convoy that is moving through the United States up into the Alberta tar sands. And the greater issue is not so much that we're going to have these vehicles rolling through and potentially causing some damage that would eventually be repaired, is that we're doing something that's greater than uh, a, a high degree of destruction to an environment. And, uh, so, Bernice, that, that is an important subject, but it's one for another night. If you have something to address the hauling of the loads through right now, that's acceptable this evening. I understand. I will refrain from coming. Thank you. The, um, the next name up is Rob Briggs, followed by Judy Sobolov and Benji Sobolov Giddis. Any of those folks here still here who like, may like to speak? Some of these are just, they've left a blank column here for us. Um, how about uh, Joshua Geidel? Joshua? My name is Joshua Geidel. Um, the, I think there's a question that wasn't answered in this uh, address is primarily to ITD. Uh, that was raised earlier about the discrepancy between the plans for Highway 12 and the actual events that took place. Uh, we saw a nice presentation of a plan with a number of contingencies covered. Um, but obviously there were a lot of contingencies. There's also a nice plan for Highway 12. A lot of the contingencies that came up were not covered in that plan, apparently, because the first load was planned for a three-day trip and it took almost 50. The second load, the test load, uh, was planned for three days, took 30 days. Your, the plan that you're presenting here shows loads going in two days from Houston to Kernel Lane, but it's hard to believe that. For me, based on the experience of the, of the, the what actually happened on the road on the 12. So my question to ITD is, how do you evaluate the credibility of the plan that's been presented? Okay, uh, Dave Couch again, the traffic engineer for ITD. Um, when, when we look at these plans, we, we, we review their calculations to see if we believe that there's reasonably confident that they would maintain that 15 minute or less delay uh, as they travel over the second under road. Um, that, that whole basically computation does not take into account issues like weather, uh, you know, uh, natural events that might occur if we have a rainstorm that just causes us a great amount of rocks rolling down the road. So, so realistically, I understand what you say is that the first one was intended to be three days. It was intended to be three days of travel, not necessarily three days of duration, because they were all contingent on whether they could travel based on weather conditions along the roadway, not only where they were traveling, but in anticipation of where they would need to travel, say, the following night, and where the best place was to leave them. Excuse me, Dave, can you put your mouth real close to that mic? I okay. see people in the back straining to hear you. Okay, does that help? There we go. So, 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 yeah, basically when we look at it, we're looking at it as uh, travel time for a segment of roadway. And you have to realize that if they make the first segment, weather may delay them for as much as two weeks. We had probably a couple of different times where we had two weeks of delay due to weather conditions, which we have no control over. Um, uh, the, the original thought was is they could make the, the conical flumps could make it in three days. 
we found that they weren't able to travel as fast as they anticipated. There were some corners that were a little uh, more difficult to negotiate than they expect, uh, expected. So in order to try to stay with that 15 minute maximum delay goal, they had to shorten up some of their loop runs. And, and so their travel sections grew from three, three travel sections to, to six. I believe is ultimately what Cardinal Phillips is doing. Uh, in the case of the Exxon Global TDM, uh, they, they actually were able to uh, prove out that they could travel in relation to what their plans show. And the only real issue we had with those uh, particular travel was, again, Mother Nature didn't play us a very good uh, hand, and we ended up in a lot of snow conditions. So, <coughs> To uh, assure that the load wasn't uh, going to create a safety issue for us, they stood down any time that we uh, felt that we didn't have a reasonable travel time period. Um, I hope that answers your question. And the, yeah, the goal would be as if uh, you had perfect conditions and you, you could count on Mother Nature to say what she was going to do. You, you have a, an ideal goal of what your trip's going to take. But we, we, in all cases, will have them stand down if there's a safety issue. We're not going to sacrifice the safety of the motors in the event of time. The next question I'm uh, asking to get Kim, Kim would like to speak also. Thank you. Uh, Kim Hansen, Global News. sign out of the water, and it was sticking up more than, uh, than it was when, before the island was trimmed down, and uh, the spotter behind the vehicle was very concerned, as well as the drivers, that if we drove over it, we damaged the tires. And so he was over on that side, and the back end of the module went a bit too far and hit the tree limb. Uh, what the loop did, uh, without any, uh, I was witnessing that move, uh, without any input from ITD or myself, they stopped on Frontage Road, they would stand down and they said, okay, what happened there? Uh, how do we prevent that? So immediately they had an extra vehicle for the first move. They put two spotters behind the vehicle. And that's our plan going forward. So they have a spotter on both sides to see if there's any obstacles. Um, when we hit the guide wire, uh, of course we, we stood down and, and a discussion with uh, just to the power company, we had a discussion with Keywood, we had a discussion with the Lou saying, how did this happen? And uh, again, it was a big communication when we talked to Vista. This is a three-lane road where we had the guide wire. Uh, two lanes on, uh, on the eastbound, one a passing and one a normal lane, and then one lane uh, uh, going westbound. The Vista guy said, I was assuming that you were going to stay on eastbound lanes and but it's a curve and so the driver seeing uh, the, the extreme eastbound lane was collapsing by the sign he started to drift over and we didn't have adequate clearance on the extreme uh, left side of the road and that's why that happened because again this is humans saying okay so we had a stand down and we went over with the Vista, Idaho, uh, County Power and Light communication companies, uh, companies, and we went down the full road again, line by line by line, to make sure we wouldn't encounter that again. So, And then, as uh, Dave said, uh, after that, it was only weather delays. So the second night, uh, we went 110 miles, far more than we planned to, but because of the planning that went into the move and, and the volume of traffic this time of year and night, we were able to just keep moving with the little impact on the traffic and, and uh, for those other than the, the traffic delay we caused when we had an emergency situation on the road where we wanted to make sure that the guy had tripped a, a, a transmission line that there was no live wires on the ground anywhere for public safety that's why we, we stayed there for as long as we did without the help of ISP and, and the power company until we could secure that spot so we were assured that there was no public was going to be 
uh, contacting a live wire. But then after that, the move went very smoothly. Uh, and so we did, we said we'd do it in three nights. Uh, it took three nights, but it took a period of time after that first incident to make sure the route was safe the rest of the way. We wouldn't do it again. And also because weather, uh, we didn't want to go up over the pass on slippery roads. The next people who would like to comment, was there something more to add to that? Okay. Uh, next people lined up, uh, Aaron Ament, Cheryl Halverson, possibly Al Halverson, and looks like, is it P. Mohan? Is that right? Aaron Ament, Moscato. First of all, I think that you uh, insult the people of Idaho when you say that we can see your concern because of our convenience. I believe that if you had uh, paid attention, you might have noticed that the people along the river are concerned about their livelihoods. The reason that we're not having 15 minute delays behind your meg loads is because of creative flagging. When you stop somebody for 10 minutes, move up, stop them for 10 minutes, move them up, stop them for 10 minutes, and you have to stop them for 15 minutes, have you? Also, the first time we were in Moscow, the loads were irreducible, not difficult to reduce, not expensive to reduce, irreducible. That said, I wonder why I should believe anything you say. And since we're not allowed to talk about the moral issues, just when is that meeting scheduled for? It's a good question, Aaron. So the City Council, um, as I mentioned at the outset, is going to receive the synthesis of tonight's meeting. Um, it will not be a public input session, but the City Council will hear uh, the synthesis of the questions and concerns posed tonight and the responses uh, will likely be uh, uh, presented with the documents that the Missoula Commissioners and the Missoula City Council members have put forward uh, as regards this issue and I understand that there are some in Moscow who will have a draft resolution to provide to them. Uh, that information is going to be taken to the Sustainable Environment Commission. I've spoken with the chair who said that they will uh, put that on the June agenda. That date for that meeting has to be adjusted because of uh, an absence from the community that day. So normally it would have been June 21st. Um, we are soliciting the input in writing um, and I think that all of this matters a lot. So. Uh, it'll come forward. Uh, somebody's going to ask the tough questions of the City Council. It's always their prerogative uh, to say yes or no. Uh, how they deal with that will be up to them. But it's certainly my intent that that will come before the City Council at a City Council meeting and, uh, and we'll go from there. That's, that's our process for this. So we will have a larger discussion. Um, so I think Aaron mentioned the delays, he talked about irreducible loads, those things have been brought up in some of the previous questions as well. Let's see, was Cheryl Halverson wanting to speak this evening? Okay, please come forward. I'm, I'm sorry, Aaron, I didn't hear you. You're welcome. I'm Cheryl Halverson. My address is in Tensing. And I'm coming to a Moscow meeting because that's the only way I get to ask the questions. So, one of the things I'd like to talk about, or I have a couple comments, then I have three questions. From the Lato, Menowoc County line to where you start into the trees south of Plum, which is about 17 or 18 miles, there are no passing lanes, there are no pull offs except inside the town of Tensed. The ambulance in Tensed is on Highway 95, or just barely off. The people who, the fire truck, uh, the fire and the ambulance is the same building. The volunteer fire department, the 
ambulance people. A third to a half of them are just off 95 where they live. The rest of them have to use 95 to access, to get to the fire truck. So, we have, a and it is approximately 10 miles from the top of the county line to Tenset, which means your convoy will be taking up all that space. So if there are, and several of the EMTs live that way. So, for my community, there will be no ambulance service during your traverse in my community. The other questions that I have, um, the first question that I have is because there are no shoulders on this section of road, and because you've talked, uh, there are no shoulders on this section of road, you've talked about, you've had pull-off places on Highway 12. It does not appear to me that you're planning to have any pull-off places on 95, so I would like that clarified. If that's clarified, I'd like to know where those pull-off places are. Because from Moscow north until where I'm talking about is narrow road, well, until Plummer, actually until Worley, is single file on occasion, except in that stretch I told you about. There are passing lanes, but that's it. So where are the pull-offs? Where are the specific, um, are you doing pull-offs? Where do you think these people are going to go to get around because there's no way around all the roads go on to 95? The other question was at the recent contested case hearing, it turns out that there's testimony saying that because of the location of the automatic traffic counters, the traffic numbers ITD provided to Imperial Oil, Hexon Mobile, and their hauler, were somewhat understated for one section from Rafino to Lowell. It's fairly a section. It's how so my question is, where are the traffic counters? Are there traffic counters in Moscow? Are there traffic counters in my county, in Benoit County? Where are the traffic counters and what are we basing this on? And my third question is, how are you going to handle on the parts where it's a single lane, there's no shoulder, how are you going to handle walking and check trucks? Because believe me, they start at 2 and 3 in the morning. Thank you. First, with the, the traffic clearing locations uh, uh, around ten, ten uh, No, we don't need to uh, build any uh, turnouts to, to move the module on uh, US 95. I would have to go to the details of our plan, but uh, we have driven that road several times, and the moon has driven it several times. We have identified uh, traffic clearing locations uh, as they were up on that other chart. Uh, they could be turning lanes, uh, they could be wide shoulders, or there could be a, uh, a passing lane where we could uh, allow the traffic uh, to go by. Um, but again, I'm following your comments, I'll go back and, and take a closer look at uh, those locations. But uh, we're about ready to submit a new uh, transportation plan to IDT. And once we do that, that'll be available to the public to take a look at it. Uh, with the traffic counters, uh, the first one we use is uh, by Genesee on the four lane uh, section, and then the next one is I'm probably going to say the word wrong, I apologize. Uh, potlatch, there's one by Potlatch which we use now. There's no automatic traffic recorder on the four lane section by Curta Lane, but so what we did is we used the same volume of traffic that we have uh, on the four lane. Uh, on the Genesee traffic recorder to use for that location. Um, so there's no traffic recorder between Potlatch and Coeur d'Alene? Uh, that's correct. No automatic traffic recorder. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Halverson, uh, that yeah, was your three minutes. So, but I...
Education Department communicate with the community of Tansen so that they may know a uh, response to her questions. Okay. Uh, next folks are up, if they choose to speak, Al Halverson and P. Mohan. Is that right? Please identify yourself. Al Halverson. You know, the problem with this meeting tonight is you folks have demonstrated an ongoing pattern of deception, misinformation, and just waving away all the problems. Uh, and that isn't what should happen. I'd like to ask you more specifically on the time delays, because you say they don't delay more than 15 minutes, but we know that that only counts one little part, and all the other delays going to and from trying to get past the mega loads, you don't count. And that is well, total deception. It is not fair to the public. You've turned the Idaho State Police into paid goons that go in front and behind your loads and don't let the public through. They are holding people two miles back from the loads and not allowing them to get through. You weren't allowing people to see what was going on. We pay your salaries. You're supposed to be working for us. And my last question is, how much did you pay Butch? Yeah, that's not acceptable. Please, please refrain from um, that sort of commentary. Uh, would someone care to comment on the uh, issue of uh, what what it constitutes delays and what would be acceptable by these this committee standard, please? Yeah, Dave Couch again, traffic engineer. Our, uh, as I said earlier, our goal is to to have a maximum delay for a voter to count one of these loads of 15 minutes. Um, we understand that going through these first few is where, uh, if you will, fine tuning the process that there was some delays that exceeded that. Uh, we've been working with the carrier to, to uh, make sure to, that they uh, understand that the goal is is that if a motor's just traveling down either US-12 or US-95, wherever these loans are going, and they experience one of these things, that their, their uh, delay shouldn't exceed 15 minutes. And uh, as we've gone through these and worked through US-12, we've been trying to find two miscommunications, I guess, if you will, on how that was to be calculated, but we think that uh, we've got that uh, misunderstanding taken care of. And uh, realistically, uh, traveling at night, we're doing that to minimize the uh, number of motors that would have to encounter that as well. So um, with that said, I guess we're, we're working to fine-tune it. We hope to get better as we do it. I guess I would like to add one more thing to that. A couple of times it was um, mentioned that, uh, or I, I, I took it that uh, a motorist was stopped at one flagger and that constantly was a 10 minute delay, and then it was a motorist was stopped at another flagger and that was a 10 minute delay. We, we want to know about that. If, if, if anybody encounters that, that is, that is not our interpretation. The way we um, interpret our 10405 rule is the carrier is um, allowed one 15 minute delay, one. They don't get it um, count two or three multiple 10 minute delays. That, if you have one 10 minute delay, you get five more minutes and that's it. So if, if, for clarification, um, when we're out there monitoring, or you're out there monitoring, or you experience one in, a, in, a, um, in your travels, experience more than 15 minute delays, more than one 15 minute delay, we want to hear about it. Okay, so let me let everybody know it's 10 minutes till 10. We still have 10 people who are signed up and who've said they want to speak. Uh, as, as we've seen, some of those folks may have gone home already. We have a few written comments. Uh, everybody okay to keep going? I know our, our audience out here is able to get up and uh, come and go as they wish. And of course, these things are, are panelists content to sit here for a few more minutes? You all right? Okay. 
let's just carry on then. Let's, the next person signed up is Joanna. And that she'll be followed by um, Jane Pritchett. And then Helen Yost. Hello. I want you people from, I, I have lived here since 2000. I've also lived in Colorado, I still own property there. I've lived in New Jersey, I've lived in Michigan. I want you people from the Department of Transportation to ask yourself this question. What did Washington go through to decide that they did not want these loads on their roads? We don't have a lot of money in this state to rebuild roads, just to please something like ExxonMobil. $10 million bond sounds like a lot of money, but we know what it costs to put a bridge over 95. We know what it costs. And what happened last time Exxon did something really bad? Remember the Valdez folks? They fought it in court, they fought it in court, and they didn't pay. That's it. You need to wake up. What happened was the guy in charge of the port down in Lewiston thought he had a good idea, Butch jumped on it, and now you guys all got in a row supporting it. And I want to tell this police officer, if you don't think that we need your officers available to the public, you're completely wrong. Thank you. And I'll tell you what, we'll all have everybody speak quickly. I just got a word that we have, what did you say, 10, 15 minutes? 12 to 15 minutes left on the memory for the city's recording. I know we have some uh, private recorders here. We could probably talk Tom Hansen into having some of his video feed if we needed to do that. But just to, so that we can document this, and documentation of the comments tonight is really important. So talk fast, answerers, respond quickly, please. My name is Jane Pritchard, and I live in Moscow at 615 North Washington, which is just one block east of where all these loads will be going through. Um, the truck traffic already on this route that goes up on 95, I already hear a lot with the people shifting gears up and down, jade brakes and everything else. And I can hardly believe what's going to happen when an enormous noise uh, happens as these mega loads go by. I can guarantee a new movie called Sleepless in Moscow. If these rigs are allowed to roll out of town in the dead of night. And this is important to me. I do need my sleep. The major S curve on uh, near Main Street and A Street will provide a substantial op uh, obstacle to drive around. And I wondered if this was a city council plan to try and take out our historical uh, corner club building. I question whether the megalos can get through Moscow without taking down street lights, stoplights, or anything along the way. I saw the great giant loads when they were parked down at the Lewiston Port and even cut down in half. They dwarf anything on our highways or our roads that run through Moscow. While we are commenting on these mega loads, I can't believe that the uh, transportation department gave this company permission to take these loads on the U.S. Highway 12 corridor, some of the most beautiful country in Idaho. In both cases, I wonder what ExxonMobil should pay to the state of Idaho and the city of Moscow for the years of highway use these enormous loads will take off our poor paved roads in Moscow and on U.S. 12. Should taxpayers in Moscow charge a user fee to allow these huge mega loads on our streets. Just think of all the, the uh, paving things that we might have to do. On a personal basis, I wonder if my access uh, to Main Street, on uh, either Morton Street or McKinley Street, will be completely closed off while these convoys pass through Moscow. I'm hopeful these answers will come out at this hearing tonight. If we're in anybody's awake. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Um, one of the things you mentioned in here alludes to some notes that we received, a follow-up uh, saying the question about precedent setting was not fully answered. What's the effect on future permits, um, uh, on highway development? Um, 
What would, would it set, here's the second question to that effect, what would it set a precedent if the lows went through, would IT let this happen year after year, or would there be hearings each time? I don't want this to be a precedent um, if we're to have mega loads come through Moscow. So we've heard this from several presenters tonight. Is there anything to be said about precedent setting? 